Welcome back to the Early Way In podcast. We head to Canada for the first time in almost four years in the UFC, treating them to a pay per view this weekend. This Saturday, UFC 289. We got the women's goat, women's band and weight straps up for grabs here. Amanda Nunez taking on rising contender Irene Aldana. And our co main event, I do believe that's what everybody's most excited for here. We got former champion Charles Oliveira fighting Benel Dairouche and what we think is the number one contender fight here at lightweight. Our feature bout of the evening, Canada's own Mike Malott taking on Adam Fugit. And uh, can't leave out Nate Landwehr versus Dan Ige. A uh, couple good fights scattered throughout the pay-per-view. We got a total of 11 fights to get into. Excited to kind of pick our favorite spots out. Uh, but before we do, as always, like the video, sub to the channel if you haven't before. And when you're finished, leave us a comment or something there below. As far as last week, we... Always transparent, going to go over the results. UFC seven, uh, Vegas 74 was a mixed bag of results for us. Uh, not as near as much violence as I was banking on. That really hurt my night. Uh, as far as our cards go, uh, it came down to the disagreement in the prop section, you know, and you came out on top there with the Albazi decision. Nice hit for you. Uh, and as always, man, hand it over to you to, to recap our cards. Yeah, no, it definitely was disappointing, the lack of violence on that card. Um, you had two 125ers on your under uh, picking the unders and the Kai Kara France Albazi and the Tim Elliott Victor Alts Moreno. Uh, you you kind of knew you were playing with fire there, but both of them had a lot of chances where it could have finished inside the distance. Um, your biggest play of the night was the Karine Silva, Caitlin Souza under two and a half, which hit with ease. And right. I think, um, you know, hits hits way, way where you were shooting it like 75% of right. the time. Um, great edge on that fight for sure. That was your biggest play of the night. And then the Johnny Munoz, uh, Daniel Santos fight under two and a half. Uh, you know, Daniel Santos comes to fight, that's for sure. And Johnny Munoz, pretty <laughs> tough. <laughs> pretty tough. Didn't go uh, to fight, though. <laughs> for going, yeah, for going one and three on the night, being only minus 1.5, uh, it's really not that bad of a loss considering the card. Um, and then moving over to my card, uh, my only straight bet of the night was Amir Albazi. Um, and then as you touched on the Albazi by decision, that was my prop of the week. Uh, yeah, the, the fight was close for sure, but I'm, I'm definitely happy to be on the uh, winning side of a close fight. You know, we we get screwed a lot of the time, <laughs> right. so I'm, I'll take this one with stride for sure. Um, the under two and a half on Caceres Pineda, uh, me, like many of the people in the MMA Twitter world, uh, all missed out on that one, even though there were plenty of chances right. for that to, to be stopped. Um, I tailed you on the under in the Silva Souza fight. I had Damon Blackshear versus Luan Lacerda fight ends by sub. I'd play that again, you yeah. know. Um, it was all it was all over there, but it just didn't hit. Um, the Santos inside the distance again is even money, and I thought Santos would put on the pressure just a little bit more. Uh, Jim Miller, Jesse Butler fight ends by sub <laughs> plus one hundred and twenty. That one didn't have a chance. That was probably the worst play on my card. And uh, then the parlay, which had Miller to win, Silva to win, Castaneda to win, mm -hmm. and Magomedov to win, lost that by split decision. That was a, a six-unit swing right there. So wish I would have gotten that one. Um, but still ended up the night plus 0. 0.22 units. Yep. And, uh, you know, easy one to forget about. Glad I didn't get stomped on this card, even though it was a tough one to read. Um, moving on to the main event of our pay-per-view this weekend, Amanda Nunez taking on Irene Aldana. And, uh, you know, I hate to complain about a card too much, but yeah, I'll be honest, this one doesn't really get me going like a lot of the pay-per-view main events should. Um, Nunez, like you touched on, she's the GOAT, gaining that title back from Juliana Pena. And uh, even though in her last performance she looked really good, um, I do think that she's at that point in her career where the motivation to come in at tip-top shape and perform mm -hmm. um, is fair to be put into question. It's similar to... John Jones reign at light heavyweight. Just where, where is this motivation going to come from? Yeah. Um, you know, I just read this morning that Nunez was quoted saying that she decided not to retire because she'd have to leave her belt with Pena. And so she's continuing to do this out of spite. And that's not really exactly the reasons that uh, are going to push you in the middle of a really tough fight to, to go through and, and give that extra effort. Mm -hmm. um, she's got a formidable opponent in front of her on Saturday in Aldana. First off, Mexico's on fire right now, man, mm -hmm. with their current champion lineup of Moreno, Grasso, Rodriguez. They've kind of got a chokehold on the future of the UFC, similar to the African champs of 2020. Um, not to mention the UFC PI being built in Mexico. It definitely seems like the UFC is more than happy 
to give anyone south of the border an opportunity to really make a name for themselves now more than ever. I'm afraid that, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing this fight much different than the public. I think if it stays on the feet, Aldana has a decent chance. She definitely mm -hmm. does her best work on the feet with her boxing skills. Um, I think that Aldana's biggest uh, threat is Nunez's wrestling. You know, depending on what Nunez chooses to do, I think that she can make this look like an easy fight if she does implement her wrestling. Or we could have a real fight on our hands if it does become a stand-up battle. Nunez, on the feet, she has a power advantage. Um, I just talked about the wrestling advantage and then the experience advantage in this fight, mm -hmm. um, which all of those, I think, make her the rightful favorite here. But as I've touched on, you know, the motivation to perform at the highest level uh, really been called into question recently. And it's t it's tough to justify a three to one uh, price tag here. You know, it it's women's MMA at the end of the day, even if we are talking about the GOAT and Aldana's no slouch. So I, I don't think that I have a, a true play on this fight. I'm curious to see if you've got something a little a little better read than I do. You you and I see this fight uh, pretty eye to eye, to be honest with you, because this one does not really get me excited either. Uh, I, I, I vote Charles and Benny for a five round headliner over this one. You know, would have would have gotten me even more excited. And and you kind of talked about her motivation. She's cleared out the division at this point. You know, it, it's hard to see where that comes from. Um, but it is sort of nice to see some new blood getting the crack at the title. Someone who's not really been at the top for a while. Um, you know, Amanda, she's just got like her power, man. It's, I don't want to say the ultimate equalizer or whatever, but she just got power that like other women don't have. It's, it's fight changing. And, and when she lands. Pretty damn good grappler as well. You know, she can neutralize a lot of these girls with the wrestling like she did against Jermaine Durandamine. Um, and I expect that to be the game plan that she comes in with Saturday as well. Um, I as well just kind of touch on where she's at mentally. Um, we saw her have a lapse in focus, you know, uh, in the first Juliana Pena fight. She did come in in near good shape and stuff, uh, you know, starting a family. She's won two belts. The girl's done it all. Um, and when you go out there and get upset by Juliana Pena, that's real easy to go back to the gym, to get motivated, to train, to get your belt back. This line is wide. You know, I know Aldana's 35 herself, but she's a much younger 35 years old. She trains with uh, Alexa Grosso. You know, there's some confidence there when your teammates coming off a big upset like that and you're getting put into the same position. You talked about just Mexico's MMA, you know, the scene at the time right now, the PI. Um, Aldana very well could be just catching Nunes at the perfect time in her career. I don't want to, you know, say she, she doesn't offer near the same power as Cyborg do. Our cyborg does, but I definitely think Aldana is up there with one of the more dangerous strikers that Nunez has stood across from. You know, she's got good size to match her. She's a clean boxer. And you've seen Aldana actually put girls out cold as well, which is pretty atypical of the women's division. Um, you just can't ignore the Holly Holm fight and the Macy Chaos, uh, the Chase on fights and uh, her inability to keep the fight standing, her inability to get the fight back to the feet. And while it does seem a little wide, it does seem potentially like dog or pass. Uh, I don't think Amanda drops the ball on this one, man. Uh, I, I'm going to go with the with the heavy favorite in Amanda Nunes to, to keep her bell on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Moving on, uh, co-main event, what everybody's most excited for. We got Charles Oliveira versus Benel Dairouche. Uh Seen plenty of guys online on both sides. It's, it's probably one of the more controversial fights this week. Uh, the biggest knock on Charles, and I think if you took this away, he's a favorite in a lot of these fights. This is durability. You know, he hits the deck at least once in every single fight. Um, you take that and put it aside, and the guy's got a ridiculous set of skills. You know, you and I uh, all over Islam. That that was a almost like a gimme to us, you know, and I almost throw that fight out to the side because he's one in a million with that type of Dagestani wrestling top pressure, you know, that can negate the jiu-jitsu. I know Benny is a very good grappler. I think it's his path to victory to get on top, but I think Charles can cause Benny a whole lot more issues from bottom with the submission upside than, than what he did with somebody like Islam. Um, and on the feet, I think Benny has shown just as much defensive holes in his game. You know, uh, he just hasn't fought the guys like Poirier, Gaethje, Chandler that have real power. I mean, we've seen Jakar close put him on skates and stuff, you know, so – 
I, I can't act like, you know, even bring up the Alexander Hernandez fight, the Edson Barboza. We can't act like we have not seen Benil, you know, chin check hurt in the past himself. And uh, while it's on the feet, the teep kick up the middle, the calf kick, the nasty work in the clinch. Uh, I really like Charles as long as his fight is on the feet. The guy has incredible forward pressure, almost exhausts his opponents by making a move laterally so much. And the sharpness of the Muay Thai, man, you can really tell over the last few years, Charles striking has just become, you know, to a different level. But I don't want to say that, you know, Benny doesn't have anything on the feet because he's a southpaw and he throws a damn good body kick. He has a dang good left hand. And you hear it slap off Gamerout's head and stuff, man. He throws some heat behind him, and he's a very, very good defensive grappler. Um, I think he needs to come out here with that approach from the Carlos Diego Fajeda fight. I think he needs to come out here and shoot a bunch of takedowns, find himself on top of Charles. Uh, you and I were kind of talking about it yesterday. The under two and a half is juiced at like minus 185, minus 190. And, you know, while Charles has hit that in every single one of his UFC fights, I'm worried that that Benny's path to victory doesn't involve him getting a finish, but rather him needing to slow the pace of Charles down, um, you know, trying to be more perfect over 15 minutes. But I'm kind of monitoring this line at the moment. Uh, if Charles is going to continue to climb, it might force a play on me. Uh, Benny is kind of like the Bilal Muhammad to me. You know, I've always seemed to kind of doubt him on his come up. He always looks like he's at an athletic and skill disadvantage out there, but always puts his game plan together and, his, and you know, and his skill set together so well and comes out on top. Uh, I think I'm going to doubt him again, though, and I'm going to go with uh, plus money and Charles Oliveira. Yeah, so I was talking to you earlier in the week. I think if their last two fights never took place, we'd be seeing Charles Oliveira sitting to at like Gamrot's money against Benny, minus 250, something like that. Um, you know, you touched on Islam made easy work of Charles last time out, but uh, we're not getting a different Charles Oliveira here on Saturday. He didn't take a, a life altering beating. He got squeezed by a juiced up Dagestan, yeah. Dagestani, you know, Um like you said, I think there's a pretty clear path to Benny. I'll touch on that more on, on the uh, podcast. But, you know, I think if he wants to win, he's got to do exactly what he did to Tony Ferguson. That's a fight that I think a lot of people should be drawing on to because he racks up 12 minutes of control time there without an issue. Like, I think that that's something he can do over 15 minutes um, any day of the week. And while I think Benny is pretty good and he's been uh, – like, like over overperforming what expectations. Mm -hmm. I think the only clear advantage that he has Oliveira is in pure wrestling. You know, Olives is dangerous off his back with, with his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, but we've seen solid wrestling pressure in the past neutralize Charles and Islam and Paul Felder. Mm -hmm. And you know, after seeing the scrambles in Benny's last performance against Gamrot, watching those grappling matches against Cron Gracie. I'm pretty confident that he's going to be able to avoid the submission for 15 minutes. Um, that that being said, I think the most likely path for Charles to win here is is drawing that brawling style out of him, uh, creating that chaos and and getting the finish. So you know, in my head, I think if Charles is winning, it's going to be with inside or inside the distance. I struggle to see how he's going to be winning minutes, whether it be on his back or off of his back. Um, or, or catching Benny enough on the feet to where he's winning these rounds. Um, so, you know, I think it should be an excellent fight, but I am picking Benny here. I do think he's the A side and rightfully the favorite. Uh, we move on to our featured bout, uh, <laughs> Mike Mallet versus Adam <laughs> Fujit. This is not a fight that I uh, really did too much work on and, and care too much about. It does seem like a spot where they're trying to catapult somebody in Mike Mallet who's coming out of uh, Canada who's young and really hasn't seen the UFC as much as I'd like for him to at the age that he's in. So he does need a breakout performance. I'm not really sure if a, you know, a finish win over Adam Fujit is going to catapult him into the top upper ranks of the division. But I do think that um, Fujit is, is tough. And so uh, if he can draw this fight out, let us see a little bit more of Mike Mallet in those later rounds and kind of, get a better grip on who he is as a fighter, as opposed to just a quick finisher. I do think that this will be um, a, a really good fight. Fujit um, nine and three. So he, he doesn't have that much experience. He's also, he, he's, he's also 34 right now. So he's not even young. Um, I do think that this is a setup fight for Mike Mallet. Although um, 
I, I don't hold the same uh, confidence as, as you might uh, yeah. when I'm about to throw it over here to you. So the pick is Mike Mallett, but yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm big on Mike Mallett here on Saturday. I, I think, like you said, Canada's putting him, you know, in the spotlight here in their featured bout because, I mean, the fight we talk about next, Nige and Land, we're 100% more deserving of the featured bout. This is obviously a spot to, to boost Mallott up. Um, with the way these guys match up, I, I just fail to see where Adam's better than Mike. You know, on the feet, I think Mike's the sharper of the two inside on the pocket. I think his boxing is a lot cleaner. I think he's a better athlete. His strikes are going to come faster. I think defensively, he shows better tendencies there. You know, he's swapping stances inside the octagon. Um, and on the mat, I think there's a significant advantage from a lot. You know, he's a very dangerous grappler. Fujit might be, I guess, the better offensive wrestler. But, I mean, Mike has just got so many tools on the mat, the massive submission upside, and a nasty, nasty guillotine that I think is going to be the, the end all here. The one uh, concern for me, you know, it is the cardio outside of round one, but I'm in the bucket of I think it's just more untested. I don't think it's a given that Mike Malad's going to go out there and gas. You know, um, the last time he did, he was 24 year old kid. He was somebody that had five fights. He was killing himself to make 145 pounds, very young in his career. And, you know, to me, I could be completely wrong. Um, but now you got a much more mature 31 year old at team alpha male, someone fighting at their natural weight class of 170. Um, it's just more of an unknown than a given that he's going to gas out. And the fight with uh, with Johan Linus, I mean, he looked patient in round one. You know, he was beating him up with kicks from the outside, timed the, the cage takedown. It wasn't the style that I think, you know, is going to make him gas in rounds two and three. It definitely wasn't like a crazy high-paced fight. Uh, with Fugit, you know, he's coming off a massive upset win over Kinoshita, bringing him to one and one in the UFC. And while I do want to give the guy the respect he deserves, um, kind of looking back, we we might have should have seen it coming. You know, Kinoshita was another young kid at only 22 years old with six fights, you know, all on the regional scene. He had never been tested, never been out of the first round. Um, you know, and, and Adam proved it to, you know, he had no gas tank. He had no defensive grappling when he got on his back. And what was the downfall of the whole situation is like up until that moment, Kinoshita was kind of looking good. You know, he was backing Adam up against the cage, landing his shots, and he drops his hands and kind of gets, you know, cocky and, and gives Adam one of these right here, you know. And as soon as that happened, Adam hits him with the left hand that sends him flying across the cage and completely changes the fight, um, you know. I don't want to talk just straight bad about Adam. He is a southpaw. You know, he's got good feints. He's got a nice little body kick. He tries to slip up top. But um, I just think Mike covers him everywhere here. And um, I know who the UFC wants to win this fight. Um, they put him in the feature bout in Canada. You know, it's only his third fight in the UFC, and he's featured bout of a pay-per-view um, in his hometown. So, yeah, I, I know who the UFC wants to win here. I think I know who has the better skill set as well. So I expected to climb uh, the line to climb even a little bit more. Um, I like Mike a lot at minus two hundred. One one other thing I got to touch on it. It just thought it was kind of funny looking at his uh, record coming into the UFC. He's been an apple pie shitter, you know. Whenever he uh, came into the LFA against Solomon Renfro, he's the plus. Uh, like 360 dog he yep. gets a shot up at the ufc against michael morales that's a huge fight he draws that out to round three which i didn't expect yeah cover um, his price then, tag. yeah and then uh it was like plus 450 for michael morales um or adam fujit against michael morales and then plus 260 coming in there against kinoshita uh, so i don't know fujit has him right where he wants him you know <laughs> um let's see this is our fight of the night we go to uh, we stay in the uh, or we go to the featherweight division where we see Dan Ige taking on Nate Landwehr, Clarksville stand up Nate right. Landwehr, Nate the um, train in the UFC. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, surely a fan favorite. Uh, I don't know if he is the most skilled fighter on the <laughs> roster, um, but he is somebody that you know is going to bring his absolute. Uh, you know, is going to leave his uh what am i trying to say here he's gonna leave it all in the octagon he's gonna leave it all in the octagon thank you thank you and my my computer's freezing up so i was just trying to get to his page but yeah nate landwehr he's coming off of a uh a pretty huge win dan Ige also coming off of a huge win against Amir, uh damon jackson where he 
you know, it had a, a string of bad losses against the upper echelon of the division. Um, he finally got a step down in Damon Jackson, and thankfully we were able to capitalize on that. I had him uh, inside the distance, had him straight, and he looked like a heavy favorite out there, and we were getting him at an excellent price tag at a buy low spot. Now he's coming up against Nate Landwehr, who's still a significant step down from the the three fights before um, the yeah. Damon Jackson fight. And um, for, for Nate Landwehr, it's kind of like, how long can he keep up this style of fighting? You know, it's it's fun for us to watch, but I don't think that it's a fight style that's um, great for longevity. Uh, you know, he he came in, I think he's been a, a dog in the Ludovic Klein, the David Onama fight. And then Austin Lingo, they finally gave him a fight that was, uh, you know, yeah. good for him, you know, one that he was supposed to win. And he went out there and did what he was supposed to do. Now I think that this is another like, uh, you know, let's really show, let's really see how good you are, Nate Landwehr. There's a there's a lot of tough fights in this uh, top fifteen of the featherweight division, and I think Dan Ige is just one of these guys who matches up really well with Nate Landwehr for what it's worth. He's a Hawaiian. He's got an excellent chin, and I think that that's what's uh, what's keeping me off of of betting Nate Landwehr here. I think Landwehr is going to push the pace, but Ige's never really shown cardio issues that that are concerning to me in over 15 minutes. And uh, Ige's chin, man. So I think Ige will eventually touch him. Um, but this being my fight of the night was really easy choice. I think both these guys bring the fight that's uh, going to be pleasing for all the fans out there. Yeah, torn between who I uh, who I want to win this fight and who I think is going to win this fight, you know. But uh, regardless of the outcome, if if Nate Landwehr is in the octagon, it's going to be an exciting one. You know, he's all gas, no breaks, just fights at a ridiculous pace. Um, you know, earlier in his career, the guy walked forward really recklessly, sometimes to his demise. Um, since the move to MMA Masters down in Florida, you know, I don't want to say maybe turned a corner, but I saw a little bit more maturity out of him in that Austin Lingo sure. fight. You know, um, it was definitely a step in the right direction. He didn't really force anything in round one, drew the big shots out of a guy that he knew he could turn the pace up on later on. But uh, and skill wise, I really do think because of his style and attitude, like people kind of overlook the skills. I don't think Nate's a bad fighter, man. I think he's a pretty decent striker, a pretty decent wrestler, and he's got a gas tank, uh, you know, an above average gas tank. And we're we're getting, uh, you know, the price that's the the perfect price to back Nate Land, where Nate's not really someone that I uh, like to lay juice on just because typically it's, you know, he has to take over a fight late with that pace and stuff. But when you get plus 200, um, it makes it a lot easier to bet on him. But in this case, man, you know, Ige is just somebody who stood a lot, stood across the octagon from a lot more elite competition, has been in five round main events. One of the main guys at Extreme Couture. Um, and he's as tough as nails, man. He's as tough as they come, hard to put away. Um, I, I really do feel like you're almost going to have to submit um, Dan Ige because you're not going to knock him out. Um, and, and while the fight's on the feet, he is the superior boxer, man, um, by a significant margin, and he carries the power advantage. And I do feel like this could be, again, like the Damon Jackson fight. You know, it's that step down in competition after after a couple hard fights. Um, and I just keep coming back to Ige, eventually finding that shot, um, you know, on Nate, or at least a big enough shot, you know, that wins the moments on the scorecards. I uh, I don't think I'm going to get to a, a bet on Danny Gay just because the price does kind of seem dog or pass, and Nate's our, our Tennessee boy, uh, and I want him to get that mic. You know, he said he's walking in unranked and walking out a superstar. Uh, I'm here for it. I want him to win, uh, but I, I do side with, with Danny Gay as the pick. My fight of the night, I went with Nasser Dean and Mavov taking on Chris Curtis. Um, another one of the fights that's been, you know, kind of heavily debated online. And hopefully it's the third time, uh, third time's a charm for MMA Factory to get one up on Extreme Couture. Eric Nick Six, 2-0 and over Fernand Lopez with Francis and Strickland. And I kind of find it funny that they uh, match him Mavov up with Strickland's good buddy and Chris Curtis here, trying to send him on a little revenge tour with uh, Chris Curtis. You know, the guy uh, made a living at, at, at middleweight here in the UFC, but he is a natural welterweight. It looks like maybe he's just – he enjoys not cutting the weight, collecting the frequent paychecks. And you got to remember, this is somebody that came over from the PFL where they have the season format where he's used to fighting more consistently and things and um, able to collect some nice paychecks. But uh, outside of the counter boxing, 
I don't know how much of a threat uh, Chris Curtis really is. He's not somebody that's going to go out there and shoot a takedown, take you down, submit you. Um, but he does have sharp hands. He works the body, and he has some slept-on power. I'm just a little bit worried that the turnaround from the Gastelum fight um, was a little bit too quick at like two months. That was a hard back-and-forth fight. He, you know, he was bitching about the headbutt that he, the headbutt that he caught that maybe potentially swayed the scorecards as well. Um, I like this fight to largely play out on the feet, where I, I do think Imabov is the better striker and the more diverse striker. Uh, a couple other intangibles, you know, he's younger. I think he's going to be faster. I think he's again more the more technical, and he's got the better footwork of the two. And I think that's good. he's going to be able to utilize um, that in the big cage. And that kind of brings me to my other point of I, I think Chris Curtis has a hard time of cutting people off in the cage. He's he kind of more follows them around, um, and I think he's just going to get stuck, you know, stuck behind Imavov on volume. I think we'll see a ton of volume coming from Imavov, a ton of kicks. He's just as durable, man, and he's the only one I see maybe even throwing in a takedown. And one thing that I really like um, for Imavov is the kicks that he throws. I constantly reference the Nicholas Dalby and uh, Daniel Rodriguez fight. It was the kicks and the volume from Dalby that really stifles like a primary boxer in D-Rod. When you're constantly throwing kicks at a boxer, you know, they've got to keep their hands up. They've got to protect their body, their head. And you don't see the volume coming from them. Um, and I really like that for Imavov here. It's back down to a three-rounder, which, you know, the gas tank is a small concern. But expecting growth and improvements from someone who was just in his first main event spot. I'm late to the party a little bit on the number, but I do see 60, 65 percent for a Mavov. I got 1.5 units on him. Uh, I think you might be on the other side, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, I might be on the other side, and I'll, I'll end up talking about that a little bit later on. Uh, I do think that it's an excellent fight of the night, and I do expect some fireworks in that one. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, fighter to watch on the card. I'm going with David Dvorak. Nice. Uh, he's 31 years old this year, 20 and 5. And uh, he's coming off of two losses. Now, he had a lot of hype coming into the UFC. You know, he had, uh, was coming out of Octagon and beaten 16 and two guys. And there was a lot of hope for him. He fought Bruno Silva, who at the time, uh, definitely not UFC caliber in a lot of people's minds. He's since proven otherwise. But he beat Bruno Silva, uh, beat Jordan Espinosa, and then Juan Camilo Ronderos. None of those guys really prove anything, in my opinion, especially, like I said, considering where Bruno Silva was at that point in his career. Um, and then he fights some of the upper echelon of the division and Mateusz Nikolaou and Manuel Kopp. And now I'm not blaming him for not winning those fights, but this is the point in time where he needs to prove that he can hang with the, the top 10 of the division. You know, Steve Ursegg isn't in any way, shape, or form in the top 10 of the division, uh, but he is a, a formidable opponent, and I do think somebody who could give Dvorak, who's had some, uh, been in a little bit of a slump, just that um, that one step that he needs to be able to make it back into uh, that prospect top 10 that, that I'm talking about. So he's my, my fighter to watch for the weekend. I think he's got quite a bit to prove. Yeah, I like that spot as well. Um I'm going to go Mark andre Barrio, you know, another Can a Canadian getting a fight in his backyard. He takes on Eric Anders in the pay-per-view opener. Um, it's a guy I, I have a one-unit bet on, so I wanted to highlight him. And I know you're, t you're thinking about it as well. Um, you know, for a guy who is historically very, very durable, it is a, you kind of kind of got pause for concern to see him finish in his last two. But when you go back and watch those, I mean, Chidi is the first exchange of the fight. That's a guy with a massive, massive reach who's very long. And he just, you know, he sniped him maybe. He, you know, did, he wasn't able to get his range and he called him early. Um, that happens, man. He, in the fluffy fight, I mean, that's just stylistically the, a horrible fight for Marc-Andre Berrio. You know, fluffy has the cardio and the wrestling. I don't think Anders offers, you know, near any of those uh, same aspects here. Um, Anders, um, I thought maybe showed a little bit of maturity, maybe turned the corner going to fight ready, but online listening to some people, he's left fight ready, man. He's unfollowed the coaches and stuff. I don't know what's going on there, but he's, he's not getting the, the level of training that he used to be. He's 36 years old. He was saying to media day that he has five fights left and he's retiring. Don't like to hear that even on the forefront of your mind. Um, I think he looks a little slow on the feet, man, and I don't think he's got the best gas tank. To me, he's a little—he's someone you can tell you can tell transition to fighting later in his life, and it's just athleticism has, has kind of carried him this far because I don't see the widest skill set. You know, it's just a big left hand. He's strong, but 
a lot of his fights recently have been taking place in the areas that I think Mark Andre thrives. You know, Mark Andre is the much better clinch fighter here, the better cage fighter, the dirty boxing, better gas tank to wear on people down the stretch. Uh, I like Mark Andre Barrio to get back on track, opening up the pay per view in a nice spot for him. I've got mine. Uh, froze up there for a little bit on me. Yeah, I was just waiting on it. Uh, just to add a little bit into the the Mark Andre Barriou, uh, zero and two in Canada under the yeah. UFC banner, and uh, you know, considering the up and down success in the UFC, this is you know an opportunity for him to secure his job in the future. At only thirty three years old, he's not extremely old for that middleweight division, but uh, this is kind of where he does need to. You know, he's still searching for that breakout performance. And I think Anders is kind of the perfect opponent skill versus name value, you know, um, the long career, but uh, he couldn't really ever put it together. And I think a, a good performance here by MAB over um, Anders could, could make him a real contender in the middleweight division and keep him that job. So I think it was an excellent choice for a fighter to watch um, for my underdog of the week. It's Chris Curtis, you know, um, I'm not like dying to bet him or anything there's a, a couple of spots i like on this card but not necessarily a dog spot um the first thing about chris curtis that i like is you know that he you know got this offer went to sean and asked him his thoughts about these uh this fight i mean they're they're practically inseparable in the training room and i do think that sean got a read on him in their fight you know and i know that styles make fights and comparing chris curtis's physical attributes to sean's is is kind of pointless but I do think that there are holes in Imavov's game that Sean thinks that Chris can expose. And I think that Chris Curtis has the uh, has the, the durability, the gas tank, and, experience to drive and, and get Imavov to the place where Chris Curtis will start to find success. Um, the biggest success being the body work. And I do think that Imavov, with his long torso, it's going to be open. Chris Curtis likes to get on the inside. And while it is a little concerning that he could be chasing Imavov around the cage, I think Imavov's best chances of winning are also getting Chris Curtis out there. So the pressure might be put on, um, uh, or the pressure might be coming towards Chris Curtis, who can counter strike with the best of them. Um, and, and then my last point is the cardio. I do think that there's a late finish opportunity for Chris Curtis. And while this isn't my prop for the week, he's my dog for the week. There's an excellent spot out there for Chris Curtis round three year decision at plus 260 or plus 280. And I really yeah. like that spot um, as I do think that his best chances of winning are uh, uh, by decision or late in the third. No, that's a that's an excellent prop to look at, to be honest with you, because I think the fight goes to decision at a very, very high clip to, to even get one of those sides at like plus 200, plus 300. It's a good bet, man, in my opinion. Uh, moving on to my underdog section, I don't know if I get there as well, but I think a plus 125 number on Charles Oliveira could be a little bit closer. Um, the guy seems motivated to get his belt back, but he's looking for his first win in Canada as well. He is 0-4 in Canada uh so oh, lo dang. looking for his first win in canada uh the guy has fought nothing but you know killers his entire ufc run and lately you know he seemed to have turned a corner the confidence is there the skill sets there um charles looked the best he ever has uh i again i throw the islam fight completely out the window i thought that was a horrible matchup for him and he flew all the way over to freaking abu dhabi to defend the belt against islam it, it was almost a gimme um, I would have liked to see Benny go through the some of the top five, the Poirier's, Gaethje's, Chandler's, kind of see how he fares against those top guys because Gamrod is a very, very good win, but Gamrod's a very limited guy if he can't find the takedown. Um, and when I look at Charles Oliveira, when I, when I pick an underdog weekly, um, when they're plus money, you really just need them to fight to a close decision, you know, to cover their price tag. Um, so when I get finishing upside on an underdog, I think it's huge, man. And I think Carl or Charles can finish anybody on the planet at 155 on his best day. And so that's something else I like to look at when I'm seeing uh, seeing anybody at plus money. Maybe Benil. Top five, the top seven of the division. I am. Um, Odds makers say it's approaching like a 60-40. I think it's closer to 50-50. I'm going to go Charles DeBronx as my underdog, even though you know I do see the, the grappling path, the top time for Benny. 
I just think Charles has a lot of weapons to to come through here at plus money. Yeah, so for me, uh, I like him as a dog. Like I said, I think his best chances are inside the distance. Yeah. Um, but for, as we move on to the prop section of the week, I'm just going against everything. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking Benny by decision. I've been really uh, liking the decision props. Uh, Martin Boudet by decision plus 350. Almir yeah. Albazi plus 440. And then this Benil Dariush by decision plus 360. You know, we've already touched on like this is a huge step for Benil Dariush. And I think that if he wasn't able to finish Tony Ferguson and his current form. I don't think he's going to be able to finish Charles Oliveira. And yeah. on that same token, like I, I am super impressed with Benil's grappling. And especially after that Gamrot fight, the scrambles that he was able to mm -hmm. create, um, just selling out for a leg to, to, you know, not be on bottom or whatever it may be. I do think that he is not going to get submitted by Charles Oliveira. So if he's willing to to follow Charles Oliveira to the ground, like uh, Islam Makachev or Paul Felder, I do think that he's going to find success there. And I think we're just talking about too high level of a fight to um, expect Charles Oliveira to find success off of his back here. Um, if Benil does just want to uh, fight for the fans, I think he could keep this standing and it'll be an excellent fight. That under will hit for everybody. Um, but I just don't think that that's what he's going to be doing here at his current age, knowing how close he is to the title. He doesn't need a, um, a outstanding performance to get the title shot. He just needs a win. And if that's all that he needs, I got to think that his mindset coming into this one is just that, just to secure a win. And all he has to do to be able to do that is the same thing he did to Tony Ferguson. And that's wrapping or er, racking up. Uh, that top time over 12 minutes. And I think he could do the exact same thing to Charles Oliveira, who will no longer be able to fall to his back and get a 10 second count and get back up to recover from hard shots. Yeah. We were, we were going through the card yesterday, talking to each other. And I was very happy to see that you thought the same thing and not all over this under two and a half in this fight. Cause if Benny wins this fight, I do think it's by decision, man. And I do think you cash that bet at a plus 300. That's a great, great number. Mm -hmm. uh, prop for me, I'm going to go with Ige and Landwehr under two and a half at minus 120. For as entertaining of a fight as this going to be, we could look back and and this number could be very, very low. You know, I'm in agreement with most people that Ige is likely the one who finishes his fight more times than not. The cleaner striker on the feet, he's as durable as they come, hits hard, and we see those defensive liabilities out of Nate all the time. But, I mean, if you can't put Nate away, man, he's coming after you for 15 minutes. He sets a ridiculous pace, and he thrives in the deep waters that most people are drowning in. Um, you know, he's talking up a big game like he's leaving Canada a star. It sounds to me like he wants to be the first person to finish Dan Ige inside the distance. And I just – you know, even the David Onama fight, I would be pissed off if I had the under two and a half there. But the fight offered – countless finishing opportunities you know and I, I think this fight could be similar when we look back and just see how many finishing opportunities situations there were throughout the fight if one of them hits minus 120 could have been a, a very generous number for us yeah i don't hate that look at all um it, yeah I, I don't hate that look at all i think the under two and a half is the safe play i'm tempted to take uh danny gay round one you know when nate lander <laughs> loses he loses in devastating fashion and it's yeah. really early and then Dan Ige, he's had a bunch of success early on. So if they are willing to engage in that war like you're talking about, I like that Dan Ige and the under just in general. Uh, moving on to the best, my best bet of the card. I'm kind of torn. There's not a lot of great spots. And, uh, you know, definitely check our, our Twitters in the, in, the, in the week. But mm -hmm. as of right now, I think that my best bet I'm leaning towards is a Ricci Lang. And I don't like that at all, dude. Like, I, I hate that that's my most confident pick here. But the Mongolian murderer, man, I think that this is an excellent spot for him, you know? Uh, Eamon Zahabi, somebody who uh, was able to to rack up a couple of decent wins against uh, Ricky Tercios and Draco Rodriguez. I think Draco Rodriguez is pretty awful, man. I, yeah. I think that he's kind of been proven that he's a fraud. And then uh, Ricky Tercios, you know, if he isn't, <laughs> if he isn't there that night, <laughs> he's just he's not there. So um, I don't think either one of those wins mean much. And uh, losing to Vince Morales and Ricardo Ramos before that, I just think Arichi Long has that style where if he um, pushes the pace, gets him to the ground, 
uh, imposes that physicality that he has. I do think that he's somebody who can break down Eamon Zahabi. And while this is, uh, you know, going against a Canadian on this card, I don't think that Eamon Zahabi, who the UFC expects to uh, have a bunch of future success in the UFC. So I don't really see this as like a setup fight. Um, Arichi Lang, he's coming off of uh, two wins after suffering losses to Jeff Molina and Cody Durden. Um, now, while he's still improving in himself, I, I like what I'm seeing on his Instagram. Uh, I think he looks like he's in killer shape. And like I said, just stylistically, I think that we're getting a pretty good price tag on somebody who's not um, just going to stand there and strike with Zahabi like Zahabi wants. Yeah, uh, we've talked about Arichi Lang and um, that's that's one of my gut feelings as well that I, I haven't locked in yet, but might by Saturday. As far as uh, my best bet goes, it's quite a few people in the community um, on Adam Fugit at a big plus number. So it's kind of making me second guess my read. But uh, I got 2.5 units on Mike Malott. So biggest bet on the card, only right to make him my, my best bet. If you are going to lay juice on anybody, I never want to sweat a decision, and I don't think I will have to. Um, Malad is an absolute finisher, all nine wins inside the distance in round one. And then, you know, always to counter that is, what's his cardio going to be like? Well, to me, it, it's more of just an unknown. I don't think he's going to gas out. I bring up the point with the Lioness fight. I thought he looked a whole lot more patient out there, didn't force anything, was patient when he got on top hunting for the submissions, and it, and it didn't look like, he had the style that was going to go out there and have nothing left in the gas tank come two and three. I think he's a superior athlete, man, speed edge. I think he's a cleaner striker, the better grappler, and that that filthy guillotine of his, I really do think is going to be a factor when you see Adam hurt and shoot a sloppy attempt. He's the pay-per-view featured bout in his homeland with only two UFC fights. It doesn't always come to fruition, but I know what the UFC wants here. I think Mike can win this fight 70% of the time. Um, but I am laying a little bit of juice. I do understand that. Um, if the tides start to turn, um, it's odds are it's because Adam has survived a very, very tough round one and, you know, and just has a lot more left. And you're going to get a great live number to hedge out. You also have round two and three props or Adam North of plus 800. So, you know, if you're second guessing yourself, there are plenty arbing out spots for him. But uh, I think Mike Malott goes out here and finishes Adam Fugit at a pretty high clip on Saturday. I like it. I like it. So moving on to our quick pick section of the podcast, we start off in the strawweight division where we see Diana Belbita taking on Maria Oliveira. Not a fight that I care anything about. I'll go with Belbita here, though. Um, since she's moved to the favorite, I'm sure as hell not playing that. So uh, that's my read, but I'm not playing that. Her moving to favorites, what's not gotten me to play it, yeah, too. Yeah. But man, I... I think Maria Oliveira is one of the worst fighters on the roster, period. Like, Belbita just doesn't have – she's not an offensive wrestler that really is just going to exploit where Maria is awful. Mm -hmm. But I do think Belbita is the clear side, man. Um, I don't know. She, she's my gut feeling that this is one of the easier picks this week. I like Deanna Belbita as well. David Dvorak versus Steve Ersig, Ersig, you know, coming in on short notice for this fight, but was already scheduled to fight Clayton Carpenter a few weeks back. So the guy's in shape. He's not flying from Australia, cutting weight, you know, on just a couple days notice. He's a good grappler, but um, I think he's bit off a little bit more than he could chew here in his first fight with David Dvorak. Uh, I like David Dvorak to get the job done. Yeah, I agree. I, I really wish that we were getting a better price tag on David Dvorak coming off of two losses. Like, I guess yeah. the odds makers also know that they're their fights that were tough for him. But man, I, I thought that we were going to get a better price tag. Yes, I'm on the Dvorak side. I don't think I'll find a spot for him this week. Uh, moving up to the 145 pound division, Blake Builder taking on Kyle Nelson. Now, while Kyle Nelson is another guy who I don't think that the UFC is necessarily trying to prop up, I do think that this is an excellent spot for him to kind of uh, be the apple pie shitter for this week. Blake Builder, somebody who's uh, undefeated, but uh, still kind of unproven, especially in my yeah. eyes. And uh, while Kyle Nelson isn't necessarily even UFC caliber, I do think that this would be one of Blake Builder's best wins. And um, for him to cover, cover that price tag, I'd be surprised. I'm expecting a little bit more of a fight. Um, so... I'll take Kyle Nelson. You know, I'm not, not going to die on that hill, but I'll take Kyle Nelson. Yeah. 
I am, I'm going to side on the other side with Blake Builder. Uh, props to the guy, you know, flew to Australia and fight Shane Young in his backyard for his debut. Now he's flying to Canada to fight Kyle Nelson in his backyard. Props to the guy, uh, but I'm I'm not as impressed either with his undefeated record. He's definitely had plenty of moments of trouble on the regional scene. I, uh, I'm i going to side with him. I'm kind of debating the under two and a half. Um you know, Kyle Nelson's last two with Duho Choi and Jai Herbert and then Builders with uh, with Shane Young. It's it's kind of keeping me off, but both of these guys typically do find finishes in their fight. I'm going to go with Blake Builder uh, with a late finish. Ayman Zahabi taking on Arichi Lang at 135. Uh, I like Arichi Lang. I, I, I really do here. Tons of experience, youth, fight ready wrestling i think there's a lot of things that you could you could say arichi lang does a lot better here yeah i'm on the arichi lang side as well i like that moving down to the women's flyweight division jasmine jazdavicius taking on miranda maverick ah double alliteration name yeah (laughs) facing (laughs) off um i'll uh i'll take miranda maverick I like this fight to end by submission, and that's kind of the play I'm looking at. I think Miranda Maverick is going to try and prove that her wrestling is up to par. And Jasmine Jazdavicius, although she doesn't have um, many wins by submissions she, or by submission, she is a, a decent wrestler. She does have a guillotine, and um, I think there will be opportunities for her if Miranda Maverick's constantly shooting over 15 minutes to uh, to wrap up something and get that Hail Mary submission. So I like the fight to end by submission, whether it be Maverick taking her down and really imposing that strength and athleticism yeah. advantage that she has, or Jazz Davishi is just catching her and throwing up a women's MMA uh, guillotine or arm bar or something like that. This is a, this is a slept on fight, to be honest with you. I don't remember who it was, whether it was Miranda Maverick or Jasmine, but after their last win, they called each other out. Like they want to fight each other, man. And I I think it's going to be a a pretty good, like good fight. I, um, I think Miranda being the more physical opponent will probably find herself on top, even though Jasmine's the one with the wrestling credentials out of Canada. She's five foot seven, man. That's a, it's hard to get in the hips and stuff when you're so much bigger than these other girls and stuff. She has to rely on a lot of like body lock takedowns. And I think Miranda's just going to be a little bit too strong for all that kind of stuff. Jasmine is no Aaron Blanchfield by no means. Uh, Big favorite. Don't know if I, if I have any action, but I'm going to side with Miranda Maverick too. And prelim main event, Nasserdina Mavov, Chris Curtis at 185. Little disagreement here in our prelim uh, main event. I'm going to go with Nasserdina Mavov. Um, Curtis is a pretty damn durable guy, so it's likely going to be by decision. I'll also go with Chris Curtis here. I think it's the experience is why I'm picking him more than anything. I think if he draws this fight out, it's a whole lot uh, whole lot closer, a whole lot better of a fight. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll go Chris Curtis here. Move, or staying in the same weight class, Eric Anders taking on Marc-Andre Berriou. Uh Yeah, Marc-Andre, he's the side. I think I'll probably end up finding a bet on him as well. Lines doing some weird stuff which yeah. I don't necessarily love, but I'm on the Mark andre side. So minus 135, minus 140, it's a good line. Yeah, I'm on the same side, Mark andre um, I think he really wears on Eric down the stretch and takes a pretty – I mean, he could have found a late finish, but I think he takes a pretty clear decision here. Uh, Dan Ige versus Nate Landwehr getting to the meat of the card. Um, I want Nate Landwehr to win, man. I, re- I really, really do, but uh, I got Dan Ige to probably probably shut his lights out. Yeah, I think I find myself on the same side. It sucks. I wish Danny Gay had even just the slightest bit of durability issues, but he doesn't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll side with Danny Gay as well, although I'll be more than happy to lose money even if Nate Landwehr comes out with a win here. Um, moving up to the 170-pound weight class, Mike Malott taking on Adam Fujit. Uh, I'll take Malott here. I think it's a setup fight for what it's worth, although I'm not uh, under the impression that Mike Malott's going to be some – champion one day or something yeah I'm, I'm not under that impression but i do think the skill set is far superior to adam fujit um anywhere it goes uh, like mike Malad inside the distance charles Oliveira, benil dirouge co-main event wish it was a five-round main event this is a this is a killer fight man and the winner likely getting a title shot take the dog charles Oliveira. Don't uh, I don't hate it. I get. I mean, I I definitely get it. This is the best price tag you'd get on him. 
Yeah, I don't know. So I, I understand it. I'm going with Benil Dariush here. I had bet him at minus 120, and uh, that line since got away from me a little bit. And I don't think I'd rebet him straight. So I'm, I'm on him yeah. by decision, but I do think that he's the A side here. So I'll, I'll take Benny. Um, and then moving on to the main event, Amanda Nunez taking on Irene Aldana for the Women's Bantamweight Championship. <laughs> I will take Amanda Nunez, sadly. Yeah, um, I feel like it's dog or pass if you look at the money line. Sure. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm on the I'm on the Amanda Nunez side as well. Um, I'm unsure if she gets to finish or if she just wins a decision. So uh, just probably won't have any action myself on the main event at all. That concludes podcast. All eleven fights been talked through. Found out the best spots, the best fights. Looking to get back on track myself this week, continue a little streak for you. Uh, Make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment when you're done watching, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.